Hello, everyone, and welcome to another interview at Room for Discussion. Now, imagine the world where markets dance to the tunes of invisible hands and the governments try to orchestrate the symphony. If you can't, don't worry. From IMF and ECB to K11 and LSE, Professor Paul de Krauer has spent his entire career analyzing markets as well as advising and teaching at the top institutions around the world. And today, he is here with us to share his intriguing insights, both from academia and policymaking. Now, over the next hour, we are not just going to be exploring the limits and missteps of our economies, but also how those ideas are applied to the real world. Were Thomas Piketty's predictions on inequality correct, or is there a way to realistically solve the climate change crisis around us, given the current political and economic landscape? And finally, we're going to see if behavioral e macroeconomics is really the key to help us understand the economy around us. And our guest is going to help us do that. So without further ado, please welcome to our stage, Professor Paul de Grauer. So, Professor, again. Welcome. <laughs> Have a seat, all yours. So welcome, Professor De Krauer. Um, you've mentioned previously in one of your lectures that you don't like talking that much about your past positions, that it makes you a bit uncomfortable. Uh, but we're going to take this risk, uh, and we're going to start with a short introduction. So throughout your career, you've worked as an academic, but also as an advisor to the likes of the ECB, IMF, Bank of Japan, to just name a few. Having written extensively on the free market, where would you say you are able to explore your economic interests more freely? Where would I what? Explore the economic interests more freely, whether in academia or in one of those institutions. Well, I think um, it, it very much depends on your own um, qualities, right? I think I'm more effective as an academic. I actually tried in politics. I was a member of the Belgian parliament for about 12 years, uh, I thought when I started this that I would have more influence. And I found out that's not the case. Um, I found out that I'm a bad politician. <laughs> and as a result, I have very little influence. It took me 12 years to understand this. And then I left politics and came back to academia. And I think um, I can have more influence, although this is limited, huh? I don't want to exaggerate, mm -hmm. but I can have more influence um, in academia by producing ideas, um, trying to sell these ideas, and, and ideas are influential, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not something that uh, we should uh, um, forget. I mean, ideas drive often changes in society, yeah. yeah. And you always remained a professor and a researcher alongside being an advisor. So is there any reason why you didn't fully commit to a career at one of these institutions? Yeah, you know, the main reason is that I didn't want uh, to get up in the morning and then coming to the office and being confronted by a boss who will tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always liked academia just for the fact that I'm a free man and I can do what I like and nobody will tell me what I should do. So that's the main reason. Now, of course, if you are in academia and you are interested in policy issues, sometimes you, you yield to the temptation of trying to be either a politician or to give advice, right? Mm -hmm. And I've done both. Uh, and again, I've learned that um, given again my qualities, I'm better in academia, yeah. Now, before we dive into your work as an academic, we just want to gauge the audience really quickly. How many of you uh, are currently or have studied economics? Okay, and how many of you, while studying, were taught that the free market is one of the most desirable economic outcomes? Okay, so quite a few. <laughs> right? It's a fundamental area of economics, of course. But is there any reason why the idea of or types of markets are still debated and written about so much within the realm of academia nowadays? Well, it has to do with the... Uh the problem of, of capitalism or free markets, that on the one hand, these are systems, the only systems that have been able of um, providing material welfare to the population. Right? We have tried many other systems, communism and what have you, 
and they have failed miserably in providing material welfare and also increasing material welfare of people. Only capitalism has been able to do that. Um, that's why sometimes people got, get so mesmerized by free markets that they think they can handle any problem. And that's a mistake, of course. But so that, that's, that's the one thing. It, it's an extremely strong system in providing um, material welfare because it's based on freedom of individuals that can take initiative and they compete, and that's a fantastic dynamics. But of course, there are limitations, and I, I see that you have uh, uh, my book here. There are limits to the market, right? And, and that create big problems with market system. And you know them, right? The, 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 most, the most important one today probably is what we call externalities, right? External costs. Uh, when an individual company produces something and then pollutes the environment, it creates costs outside the, the own company and doesn't pay for it, yes. right? Uh, others pay for it. And as a result, the market system is screwed up because the prices that will come out of this mechanism do not reflect the true cost for society. And therefore, the too much will be produced of these things. And you need an external institution that will control this because the system cannot control it itself, cannot mm -hmm. auto-control itself. So that's the, the first major problem. The second major problem is inequality. The market system is just indifferent about distribution, right? You don't care. The market system doesn't care whether some people have nothing, may even die. The market system has nothing about this. You can have some free people doing something on the margin, but um, the market system cannot deal with this. And again, you have you need an external institution that will correct for that, right? Yeah. And then the third one is concentration. Um, that's a paradox again of capitalism. The most successful ones, individual entrepreneurs, are the ones who take over the whole market, right? Yeah. And then they get the monopoly situation. Yeah. But then you destroy capitalism that is based on competition. Yeah. So again, you need some institution that will correct for this. And that's hard work, right? Because yeah, yeah. you will have to go to the political system and that's very difficult. But So that's the ambivalence of Marx. It's a great system but full of problems that we have to deal with by having uh, external institutions, yeah. governments, that will limit the domain of the market. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to delve deeper into those limits of the market later. But you've mentioned that people are sometimes mesmerized by those, by this free market and this whole idea. And in your book, Limits of the Market, that you pointed out, you say that there have been moments in my life when I firmly believed that the market could offer a solution to most economic problems. And my question is, did your perspective shift gradually or was it the result of like one specific event in your life? Well, it's, it's not, I didn't have a, a Eureka moment. I made it in this uh, bath and yeah. uh, Eureka. No, it was a slow process. Indeed, when I started economics, I was mesmerized by um, the Chicago School, you know, free markets, and, and we economists would teach the sociologists and the political science how to analyze uh, social problems, right? Um, they should take over our paradigm. Um, and I was very much enthusiastic about this, right? This all started in the 70s and 80s, and I was very much captured by this. But then, after a while, you look around and you say, well, there are a number of things that happen that are not to be understood by this. For example, um, when I was a student, we, we were very much influenced by the Kuznets curve. I don't know whether you know this thing, the Kuznets curve. It says that when... Um, countries evolve from low development to high development, right? Um, so they become richer initially. That leads to an increase in inequality. Huh? You said you have a graph and the level of income per capita income on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis inequality, right? So initially inequality increases, but at some point when the level of welfare of income has increased sufficiently, inequality will go down again. This was the Kuznets curve. Mm -hmm. Kuznets had found that uh, based on U U.S. data for a very limited 
number of years, and we all believe this. And, and, and in the beginning, I was saying, well, don't worry about problems of inequality. This will disappear, right? And just let the market do its work. It didn't disappear, right? When you, after a while, you looked around, you said, that it's not going on like that. Yeah. Inequality does not decline. On the contrary, it increases. And now we have many, much evidence about Piketty and others um, have, have documented how inequality has increased. So, mm -hmm. And then I, I take the view of a scientist, right? When the facts are in contradiction with your theory, just reject the theory, right? Don't try to reject the facts, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Some, too many people are in love with their theories and then will reject the facts. They will say, oh, the facts, oh, we don't care, right? Uh, so that, that has been my um, driving idea. The facts should prevail. Um, you know what Keynes said, um, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit the attitude that, I, that I've been taking. And as a result, I've changed my mind about the market system. I still believe fundamentally that that's the mechanism, the dynamics that we need, but we have to take into account all the limitations that so the we discussed earlier. So the moral of the story would be don't fall in love with the models. That's right. Yeah. So don't fall in love with the model. And I have, I guess, some colleagues who have fallen in love with their model. Mm -hmm. And then it's difficult to, to get rid of the model, right? Uh, yeah. And um, in your book, you mentioned that we need a bit of government, we need a bit of market, and there are those pendulum swings between the, when the market is, in, um, is outbalancing the government and the other way around. And do you believe now that the nation's balance is fixed or still it is perpetually shifting? I think those? it is, yeah, yeah. So my book is also about the history of capitalism. And when you look at the, the, the last 200 years, it's striking to find that you have had periods where markets... Uh, are expanding. Yeah? The, the second half of the 19th century was a time where markets expanded, um, countries were opening up the markets, and, and capitalism was flourishing until the First World War. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then in the aftermath of the First World War, the 1930s, and, and the, 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 the implosion of the system, right? governments took over, right? And, and many parts of the world, um, in the Soviet Union, in China, but also in Europe, governments took over in the sense of regulating, taking over economic activities, taxing people. I remember up until the uh, 1980s, the top marginal tax rates in countries like the US and the United Kingdom exceeded 90%. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine? These were the times... I'm talking about the period um, from the 1930s until about 60s, 1980, right? 60s, when yeah, Kennedy... 50 years, Kennedy. half a century, people were saying, these rich people, you have to tax them, take away, because if you have a, tax, a marginal tax rate, the top marginal tax rate of 95%, which was the case in the UK, mm -hmm. you really say after a certain threshold income, we take everything away from you. And this was considered to be the right policy because these rich people are just too rich. <laughs> and we, that when you get too rich, they don't contribute any longer. And so this was the paradigm at that time. So governments were there, right? We, this unraveled from the 1980s. Tax rates declined dramatically. Now the paradigm is these rich people, they contribute to our welfare, right? <laughs> Trickle down economics and what have you. They, they are doing fantastic things. Don't punish them. That's the paradigm that we have developed since the 1980s. And as a result, top marginal tax rates have dropped to very low level. And if you are clever enough with the taxation system, you pay almost no taxes when you are rich, right? Yeah. Not us, right? <laughs> <laughs> we cannot do that, but the real rich people pay almost no taxes. And we accept this. And then, yeah, I think this will change again. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, yeah. this is the cycle that we have seen, right? Mm -hmm. uh, capitalism booms. Then you get control by governments because people realize that 
capitalism in its excesses produces this extreme inequality, for example, um, and then you want to change this. But then governments take over and also, also mess up things, right? And then you have a counter movement. Yeah. And now I think we, we are again in a counter movement where governments will take over more. So right? do you think, on the topic of that top marginal rate, do you think we'll ever get to 90, 95% again, or is that too far? No, but you may see it. Yeah? If, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know, 95%, but I mean, um, we, may, we may end up seeing that. And when you we have had an election, in Belgium there will be an election, people become sensitive to this, yeah. right? That you have these guys who make millions and millions, and do they contribute? They don't. Then you say, well, why not we change this? Yeah. And this will, this will happen. Yeah. Whether we go to 95, I don't know. And when this will happen, I don't know. Yeah. So many things are impossible to predict. But there will be a reaction, yes, yeah. of course. Because there is a sense of fairness that we, we all have, right? And, and, and when it is clear that billionaires do not contribute in the way um, we expected or we thought they would contribute, then there will be a backlash. Yeah. But developing on the idea of pendulum swings... Uh, in the same book, you mentioned that those happen uh, as a result of markets and governments hitting their limits. Mm -hmm. And one of the internal limits you point out is that of inequality. So seven years on from when you published that book, do you still see inequality as one of the biggest internal limits? Well, inequality is... is I, I see two big uh, issues. Um, one is the environment. Uh, mm -hmm, of course. And, I mean, the global warming... Um, and the other one is inequality, yeah. right? And, and, and inequality is also co related to concentration, right? There's so much inequality also because there's concentration of economic activities, yeah. right? Um, and these are the two big issues. Um, now, it's very difficult to predict which one will in the end push for change, whether it's the environment. I tend to think it's more likely to be the environment because mm -hmm. that uh, has now created a critical moment, right, where um, this whole thing could unravel, right, where you, you could have trigger points where you lead to accelerated global warming with, with tremendous um, effects on societies. And I think that will come first before yeah. people start um, revolting because too much inequality. Yeah. But these things... I don't know. I don't want to predict, you know, maybe the, the, the inequality issue is also very powerful. People feel uh, and are very much concerned about fairness, I yeah. think. And, yeah. That's understandable. Um, however, you express somehow more optimistic view on the future that mentioned in your book, Thomas Piketty. I think you devoted the whole chapter of Thomas, for Thomas Piketty, who was also our guest. You can see his picture right here. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why do you believe that we as a society will probably not return to the level of inequality during the ancient regime? Why we would not return yes. to that? Well, I think because uh, at least in, in Western Europe, there's more democracy. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and in, in democratic system, there is great opportunity, bottom up. Uh, reaction, people reacting bottom-up and pushing politicians in, in a particular direction. Um, the, the Ancien Regime was extremely unequal, much more than uh, we have now, and led to revolutions, right, to violent revolutions that then changed the distributional outcomes for a while. Um, so I, I think we, we have to live in democratic societies where we can do it without revolution and, and <coughs> the, um, without the violence of mm -hmm. revolution. But in authoritarian systems, you may still have it, right? Yeah. I mean, there are enough authoritarian systems in the world where um, at some point you could also have this. Yeah. But in our democratic countries, we probably won't experience another revolution. Well, you never know, of course. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, what is a revolution? I mean... Um, the, the, the kind of violent ones that we have seen in the past, I don't think so. But um, as you can see, even democracy is very fragile, and um, 
some countries may turn into authoritarian systems, right? So, so that, uh, that's another issue, yeah. Yeah, but uh, moving on from revolution, of course, uh, another guest we had on our uh, lovely sofa was Ingrid Rubines, who is a political philosopher, and she has presented an idea where all wealth should be capped at roughly 12 million euros. And you've come out and been opposed to introducing a cap on wealth. So where do you stand on an ideology like that? Well, I'm very much in favor of policies that uh, avoid this extreme inequality. Yeah. Right? So I agree with her that um, we cannot have this extreme inequality. The issue is how do you do it? Yeah. And there I would have a different view. I don't think it's, it's a good idea to cap yeah. um, wealth. I mean... 10 million or what have you, um, how are you going to do that? How are you going to avoid that people try to get out of this? I don't think that's a good way to do it. I feel more like uh, the proposal of Piketty where you say we will have a progressive taxation on, yeah. on wealth, right? Yeah. Where you say, okay, the first one million we will not tax, yeah. for example, right? just an example. Yeah. Because yeah, these are people, fathers and mothers that have saved a lot and they want to give something to their kids. So we should respect this, right? Yeah. Uh, um, but at some point, you, you start taxing everything exceeding. So if beyond one million, you would say, we tax 1% a year, right? Um, not, that's not confiscation, right? 1% yeah. a year. <laughs> um, and then when you move up, say, beyond 10 million, 2% a year. Yeah. Before 100, beyond 100 million, 3% a year. Yeah. And maybe a billionaire, 4% or something. So this kind of progressivity, and the idea is, it comes from Piketty, right? What we observe is that wealth tends to increase faster than GDP. Mm -hmm. right? um, and as a result, if you let it go like this, there is such a disproportion, wealth accumulation, right? That it becomes a danger for... Democracy, and we see it all around. These billionaires want to influence, right? Yeah. They have sometimes crazy ideas, and they have a lot of money to try to impose these ideas. So you have to prevent wealth to increase faster than GDP. Yeah. And that would be the system that I favor. So let people get rich, right? But limits to, yeah. to wealth accumulation. You have to impose limits to wealth accumulation. Not ex completely excluded, but limit, limits, yeah. yeah. On the topic of a progressive wealth tax, you already kind of touched upon it, but in the book you wrote that it would save capitalism from capitalists. Yeah. Could you expand on that a bit more? Yeah, of course. I mean, this is in, in the line of what I have been saying. Capitalism will destroy itself if it doesn't limit the inequality that is inherent in the dynamics of capitalism. If you don't try to limit this inequality, then capitalism will be destroyed. And we have seen it in history. That happens when inequality becomes too big. So therefore, those capitalists who try to um, block any attempt to tax wealth, actually in the long run will destroy capitalism. So the capitalists are those who destroy capitalism. It also has to do with concentration, right? Again, here, the, the most successful businessman is the one who has taken over the whole market. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, you destroy capitalism. And so you have to prevent this from happening. And staying at the topic of the progressive wealth tax, the most common argument against it seems to be the idea of wealth flight, where wealthy individuals relocate to tax havens um, and take their intellectual capital with them as well as tax revenue, also adding to the global inequality. Yeah. Is the wealth flight, in your opinion, as significant as it is portrayed right now in the media? Well, no, of course, it, this is a very important practical problem. Um, but let's not confuse things, right? Because my discussions with, with people about this is usually or often um, along the lines you say, they say, OK, fine. Um, but if you do that, we have this practical problem that these rich people will move out. Right? Um, but then we first should be clear on the following. Do you agree that we should do something 
to limit wealth accumulation and extreme inequality. Right? If we can agree on this, then we can start talking about the practical implications, right? But not the other way around, not hide your, the fact that you disagree by saying it's practically impossible to do. <laughs> Let's first agree on, on the principles. Yeah. Should we do it or should we not do it? And then my experience is that most people think, yes, it should be done. And then you can move on to the practical problems. How are we going to do it internationally? Because it has to have an international dimension, right? Yeah. And we already have done that with the OECD, for example, yeah. minimum taxation of, of multinationals. It's a very small step, but it can be done. But you first need, at the level of each country, a consensus that this is good policy. And then we can move forward. Yeah. Right? But not say, oh, we, it cannot be done. And you say that actually because you don't like it to happen. So, uh, because you touched on the OECD thing there, I want to ask, because ja Janet Yellen, former Fed chairman, recently mentioned the idea of a global uh, profits tax capped at seven, no, no less than seven. What do you think of an idea like that? You mean a, a minimum tax? A minimum it? tax, exactly. Yeah, but we have already an agreement to go in that direction. Yeah, right? and do uh, you think that is the way forward? Yeah, slowly? sure, of course. We, we, yeah. that, that's the way forward, because we, <coughs> we talked earlier about the fact that personal income taxes have <coughs> gone down um, significantly, but also uh, profit taxes, corporate yeah. income taxes have gone down, right? It used to be that in most countries... Um, uh, person, no, um, corporate income taxes were like 50% plus, right? Now it has gone down everywhere to 20, 25%, and effectively the amount paid is even lower. And then, of course, what happens and why billionaires are billionaires is that all their income is stacked into these companies, and yeah. they, they pay almost no taxation, right? They pay ridiculous amounts of taxes. Um, and, and I think um, we, we have to change that also. Yeah, it's part of the, the total. Yeah. So because of the role of democracy in our system, you express somehow optimistic idea uh, about the future of inequality that will be able to redistribute the wealth. However, as you mentioned already, you are more pessimistic about the external limit, mainly the climate change. Mm -hmm. And do you think that the market system is more likely to reach this limit because we already reached the tipping point? Or why do you think that's the case? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty about these things. I mean, um, I, I, I read and I hear two different views about the future of the climate. One is, let's call it a linear view. Um, the, the, there will be global warming, and that's a slow process, right? And, and the world is getting warmer, but we will have enough time to take precautionary measures, uh, hire dikes like you do here, right? And, and, and some people will move, and in the end, this will be okay, right? Um, but then you also have a nonlinear view with tipping points where you say, well, at some point, it could all unravel and accelerate that we don't have the time to do all these things, right? And I, I'm not enough, um, I, I don't know enough to be able to say it's the linear or the nonlinear view. I tend to have sympathy for the nonlinear view, or at least we should not exclude it. And, and, and since this is a serious possibility, let's take that into account. And therefore, I. I in a way, I'm afraid that this may actually be the, the more binding future um, evolution. And, and that, of course, um, says that we should act very quickly. Yeah. And in your book, you bring up Bjorn Lomborg a few times, who cites technological advancements and innovation as one of the key components of combating climate change. But you don't seem too persuaded by his ideas. So is there any reason specifically why the ideas of tech optimists don't really sway you towards them? No, I, I do think that technological changes are very important and, and, and also to solve the, the climate problem, but it has to be directed. Right? It will not do it by itself. Let me give you an example of uh, airplanes. Right? <coughs> airplanes, they fly around, they emit CO2, they are barely taxed. Right? Yeah. 
why would um, companies invest in new technologies that reduce the CO2 emissions from airplanes? They, they don't want to do that. They, they will do other things, right? Um, but the way you should handle this is to say we will tax the CO2 that you emit, and that will give incentives to these plane manufacturers to look for new technologies that will minimize CO2. So in other words, I do believe in technological solutions, but you have to direct them. You have to direct them to solving external costs, and the market doesn't do it by itself. If you can pollute at zero cost, yeah. right? You can just pollute and throw out everything at zero cost for you. Why would you invest in new technologies that will reduce pollution? You won't do that. Mm -hmm. You would do other technological changes, but not that. When will you start doing this? When you are paid the price. When the government says, if you emit CO2 or other toxic substances, you will pay a price, we will tax you. Yeah. Then you will start looking for new technologies to solve that problem. So in that sense, I'm a technologic, technological optimist, but it has to be driven by governments so that the market system can then compute the correct prices. Because today the prices are just not correct. Prices, when you take a flight, the price you pay does not uh, reflect the true cost of flying for society, which is much, much higher than what you uh, pay. And therefore, there has to be an intervention from outside imposing the right prices. And then the system will work. Then I, then I become optimist. Then <laughs> the system will work to develop new technologies. And then you don't need the government to actually try to look for new technologies. That, there I'm... I'm still the free market guy, you know, <laughs> um, that believes that with competition, um, this will lead the, the, the entrepreneurs to do the right thing. But they will not do it except if they are not given the right direction. They have to go there and not there. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And another scenario that you bring up in your book is the reformist scenario that assumes that in order to combat the climate change, the democratic institutions within our countries have to take those that are affected by the environmental harm into account first. Right. That's the first step. But those who are most severely impacted by the climate change, they don't have the direct access to our democratic institutions. How do you suggest that those disenfranchised make their voices heard so that we take them into account? You mean the, the people, low income? The, pe people? the people, for example, in um, Africa I, uh, okay. that are severely affected by the environmental harms. Yeah, that's going to be very difficult, but I would, I would say the, the first step is, of course, to, to solve this problem in, internally, right? Mm -hmm. Because that, that is certainly something that, that we now find out everywhere. Huh? You, you impose uh, taxes uh, on, on, uh, on, on cars, for example. Look at what happened in France with Gilets jaunes and, and all that. You, you impose a tax there, and, and the Parisians who don't have a car, right? because only one third of the Parisians have a car, they have the metro, they don't feel that, that problem, right? The, the driving around by car is becoming more expensive. Who feels it? Well, the poor guy is living somewhere in rural France and they have no access to anything, and they have to drive that car. So there is a revolt from these people, right? Mm -hmm. So you have, to, you have to take that into account in, in your whole strategy, and this can, again, only be by... You, you should maintain the idea that driving a car should be taxed, but then you should compensate the losers, right? And that's not always easy. It's easy to say for me, right? Let's compensate the losers. But if you want to compensate <laughs> the losers, we have to take some of my income away, right? Yeah. And, 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 and so it's very difficult, but that's how it should be done. And, and of course, if you look at um, countries like in, in Africa, that, that's, that's even more difficult. Huh? How are we going to... to to, to deal with this, we should also, of course, through development aid, mm -hmm. try to compensate them, but that's probably even more difficult. Now, uh, to round up the discussion, the guiding principle you gave at the end of Limits of Markets 
was that we need to deal with our reality as Sisyphus would uh, to try to set that rock in motion and remain happy. Or in your words, that this is the only way to give meaning to our existence. While I think it's a beautiful sentiment, it also seems quite a pessimistic look into the future. So how would you say people can remain happy with that idea? Well, yeah, I've been very much influenced by Albert Camus, <laughs> right? Le Mythe, Le Mythe de Sisyphe, uh, which is a beautiful book. Um, and he starts out that book saying the, the first philosophical problem is suicide. The right? uh, sole problem, philosophical, is suicide. The, the, the only um, philosophical problem is the suicide. Because it, it goes out from the idea, life is absurd. Yeah. There is no meaning in life. So what do you do when you, when you view that life has no meaning? You better get out of life, right? Yeah. And then he turns this around and says, yeah, well, life is absurd like Sisyphus had an absurd life. He had to walk um, this walk up the mountain every day, and at the end of the day, the walk really would... Does go back, and the next day he would do it again eternally. Yeah. That's really senseless, right? Yeah. That's, that's not a life, right? <laughs> yeah. Who would like? And then he says, but yes, life has no meaning. Yet, we can give it some meaning, right? By revolting, yeah. by changing, uh, by, by, by loving and, and introducing fairness in the system. Uh, despite the fact that you know ultimately it has no sense. Yeah. And then he ends his book and says in French, il faut s'imaginer Sisyphe heureux. You should imagine that Sisyphus actually can be happy. Yeah. Right? And, and that's also the attitude I take. It, it looks like daunting. Can we solve this problem? Yeah. Maybe we won't be able to solve it. Maybe it's totally senseless, yet we have to go on. Yeah. We cannot commit suicide. <laughs> and on that beautiful sentiment, I think it's a good time to turn to the audience for some questions. So if you guys have a question, please raise your hand and my colleague will bring a mic to you. Yeah, right up here. Hello, thank you for being here. I have a question concerning like a recent research paper from Unten and Splinter, if I'm right, that they claim that uh, inequality in the US only slightly raised since the 80s, which was a bit challenging the Piketty's and Zuckman um, conclusion. Um, what do you think about this paper, if you heard of it? And yeah, about this conclusion of all. I'm not sure I know which paper you're talking about. Uh, it was like a um, recent paper that been published in famous journal in uh, six months ago, I think, in October, something like this. And they conclude that the inequality slightly, just slightly rose in the US. Um, and they were like saying that Piketty ah. was wrong. Uh, ah, that contesting Piketty. Oh, yeah. is that the one? Yeah. That was published in. in so, what's your uh, opinion about economy. this paper and this conclusion? Do you think, like, still we can still say that inequality rose uh, in most of the countries? Yeah, I think so. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, this is a very technical paper about the, the possible reasons why Piketty might overestimate the degree of inequality. And I must say, I, I, although I, I've, I've seen the paper, I've read the paper, but I, I cannot judge. It's a very US-centered paper, right, on, on uh, possible reasons why it might be overestimated. But there are so many other indicators, right, of... Uh, inequality that has grown that you, uh, I, I tend to maintain that um, yes it has been increasing right uh, and and this one paper by these two guys will not um, destroy that that I that uh, fact that we observe so it's not only in the US but you observe it in Europe also and um, yeah that's all I can say about that paper here yeah. We have one more question over there. Oh. 
Yeah. We know each other for a very long time and I know you have very broad interests. And I was wondering, can we also turn to Europe? Because um, I think Enrico Letta, he just recently, this week, he came up with his uh, you know, conclusions. Um, and uh, on, okay, how should Europe go forward? We will expect the Draghi uh, report mm -hmm. in a couple of months' time. And I was curious to have your views on this. If, for example, um, you know, Europe should develop an industrial policy, yeah. but we also know, and we just talked about uh, markets that may hamper uh, free markets. So can you, I mean, could you, if you're, you know, feel comfortable to to set out kind of broad lines on you know what are the Europe's priorities in this uh, regard. Okay. Um, thank you, Rul, for your question. Um, we we have to be careful that we don't uh, get taken away by what happens in the U.S. and in China. Right. The U.S. has started this. Uh, program of heavy subsidies to a particular number of industries. China is also known to, to do this. And now the, the prevailing view in Europe increasingly becomes that, why don't we do the same thing? Right? We allow um, governments to subsidize particular companies um, as a way to react to what happens elsewhere. I, I don't think that's the way forward. Um, I'm very skeptical about our capacity to develop this kind of industrial policies. I mean industrial policies of the type governments are going to pick the winners. Right? Can governments pick the winners? And there I'm very cynical. Governments typically do not pick the winners. Um, the system, the market system, picks the winners in a, in a many very different way. That is... Now, many initiatives, many people, many entrepreneurs start something. The majority will not be successful, and the minority will be successful. And that's the mechanism. It's a kind of evolutionary system that will drive innovation, right? And trying to do it by governments picking the winners, I don't think that's the, the right approach. On the contrary, we, we sh there, I think we should rely more on, on market systems. And there, I agree with Letta that we should allow the, the single market to work, right? And, and, and not go in the direction of state subsidies. That's not the answer to the industrial problems that we face. Um, there is another dimension to this that is protectionism. Um, to the extent that the Chinese protect their markets and do not allow us to compete in China, then we should be ready to say, but if you don't allow it, we will do the same thing, right? Because we in the European Union are a strong force in terms of our capacity to convince the Chinese that they should open up. That's where I think uh, we can work. And then the, the, the kind of industrial policies should be things that the markets don't do well. What do, do markets don't do well? Well, that's in terms of public goods, um, infrastructure, um, research and development. That's what markets don't do well. That's where governments should focus, not trying to pick the winners. That's generally what I, I can say about this. Yeah. Thank you for those lovely audience questions. Coming back to the discussion, when you write about the market missteps, you include the psychological aspect to it as mm -hmm. well. If the audience today were to Google behavioral macroeconomics, uh, right now they would see that you are one of the people that come up um, in the search. And as fans of behavioral economics ourselves, we would like to discuss it a bit. Both in the realm of academia and policymaking, behavioral microeconomics is much more readily accepted mm -hmm. than behavioral macro. Why do you think that's the case? Why? Um, well, I think at the, at the micro level, um, it's more difficult, it's, it's easier to handle this, right? It, for example, in financial markets, um, it used to be that um, from Chicago we had this view, financial markets are efficient, right? Um, 
if you make excess profits because you were lucky. Um, and so that's, that was the idea of efficient markets. Um, and we have found out that there are many departures from that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and many different cases could be found that this was just not true. And that has led to behavioral economics at the micro level. Initially, mostly in the financial markets, right? Um, with uh, um, Kahneman and, and others do, doing uh, fundamental research there. At the macroeconomic level, we have gone in a different direction. The macroeconomic models from the 1980s have been based on an extreme view about how individuals work and, and, and act. The view that they are utility maximizers, right? If you look at these models, these are all individuals, one individual having a utility today and the rest of eternity, right? It's a, it's a, it's a utility stream, eternal, right? Yeah. And maximizing this, using all available information, and having rational expectations. Rational expectations means what? It means that all these individuals understand the complexity of the world in which they live. There's no secret for them. The only thing that they don't know is the shocks that will hit them. But they know the distribution of these shocks, of all the possible shocks that will hit them. That has been the paradigm in macroeconomics. When you think about it, as, especially as an outsider, you say, but wait a minute, is that what individuals do? You, a, a utility maximization with infinite utility stream, understanding the full complexity of the world and knowing the distribution of all the shocks that will hit you. You say, but... This can't be true. Yet, that's what macroeconomists do. Nothing but that. And this has become a religion. And then I'm saying, no, let's try to, to do something else. Right? And what I've been doing is to say, well, people have cognitive limitations. They don't understand the complexity of the world. And let's accept that, that they don't understand the complexity of the world. So what do they do then? Well, they have simple rules. Heuristics, they use simple rules, but they are no fools. When they find out that the rule that they are following is not doing well compared to other rules, they will be willing to switch to another rule. That's, that's rationality, right? You are willing to adjust your behavior if you find out that what you did before was not. But you find it out exposed. You don't know in advance. You find it out exposed, and then you correct yourself. It's a learning mechanism, and that's... That's what I'm doing now, and not only me, but for example, Carl Holmes, who is here in the building somewhere, I don't know, but at least he's teaching here. Yeah. Um, he has also been doing this. And that gives a much richer um, view of how the macroeconomics functions, the dynamics. It, it also can explain why we have booms and busts, why at some point um, everybody can become optimistic. Yeah. You, it's like, I meet you, I see that you are smiling, you are optimistic, I also become optimistic. Exactly. And then I turn, my, my wife sees me, she becomes optimistic. And everybody becomes optimistic. Yeah. And that creates a boom, right? Um, and then sometimes, it then, at some point, it unravels. And everybody can become pessimistic. And that's the kind of mechanism that we observe. Happens all the time. But that cannot happen in these rational expectations. Yeah. Because these people are just too rational. Why would they be influenced by optimism that has nothing to do with reality? Because these movements of optimism, euphoria, are dissociated with reality. They are just some perceptions. But why do we have the perception? Because we don't understand the underlying world very well. And then we look at each other, right? And, exactly. and I think that you are better informed than I am. Yeah. And then I'm following you and say you are optimistic. Yeah. So I, I better be optimistic also. These are the mechanisms that then become important to drive the macroeconomic dynamics. And it's so much more interesting than this individual utility maximizing, understanding everything. Yeah. That, and so we have developed these models now for the last 30 years, and they lead nowhere. I mean, when we had the financial crisis, right, none of these models turned out to be useful to understand what was going on. They were all saying, well, it's an external shock, you know. Some shock has hit us, and, and that's it. 
No, it was the internal dynamics of capitalism that was going on there, yeah. and we, we failed to understand it. Yeah. Uh, you know, the queen, the queen came to the Lawrence School of Economics. You, you may have heard this story. The, 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 the queen Elizabeth, right? She came to LSE just after the financial crisis, and uh, she turned to all these economists, and then she asked, why have none of you seen this happening? <laughs> none of them, none of them. And then when the queen had left, they were sitting together. Let's have, what did I come up? Let's have a committee to answer the queen. And then they had a committee and they wrote a 10-page long letter to the queen trying to understand. I think they should have said it's because we used the wrong model. Yeah. But they didn't do that, right? There were all kinds of ad hoc reasons why they couldn't forecast what had happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, but we, we, we have been, in, 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 in macroeconomics, we have been using the wrong model for the last 30 to 40 years. And then I, what I experience now is that this becomes a religion. If you are an outsider, you try to do something else. You send it to, to publication, to a top journal. The, it will be desk rejected. What does desk rejection mean? It means that the editor looks at the title and the abstract and sees weird things like non-rational expectations can be good. Right? He's the gatekeeper. And these are heretical ideas yeah. right? and should not be used anyway. Uh, well, you mentioned like these models had failed in, in that period, right? And you've worked at multiple policy-making institutions yourself. So did using these classical institutions at those places drive you towards trying to understand and find models that might actually work? Yeah, that's right. I, it did. Let me turn to what happened in the period 2010-2012. Uh, this was the time of the sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone, right? You may remember you were all born then, right? Uh, um, so... <laughs> Um, so this was the time where suddenly um, there, there was a panic. Greece had turned out to have falsified the numbers of the budget deficit and debt. Um, so panic, um, investors dumped all the Greek bonds, probably rightly so, but then turned to the others, um, the Spanish, the Irish, the Italian, Portuguese bonds, and also started dumping it. What was the prevailing view at that time? It was based on efficient markets. Well, since the market rejects these bonds, sells these bonds, there must be a terrible problem in these countries, solvency problem. The Spanish government, because the market is selling Spanish government bonds, then the yields go up and the prices of the bonds decline. So the market was saying the Spanish government may become insolvent. Efficient markets. And then policymakers also we're saying efficient markets, that is becoming insolvent. What do we do when you become insolvent? You have to cut spending, austerity. The reaction was austerity, making things worse. I looked at this and I said, no, the Spanish government is a solvent nation. Spain is a solvent nation, yeah. right? What happened is panic. Investors were panicking. They had seen Greece. That was a real problem. And then they said, maybe there are other also. Let's dump Spanish bonds. Let's dump Italian bonds, right? And, and so the fear was that Spain, Italy, Portugal were insolvent, right? By dumping the bonds and raising the yields, you made it difficult for these governments to fund bond issue, to, to, to issue new bonds, right? Creating actually the risk that they would become insolvent, illiquid actually, mm -hmm. but then also maybe insolvent. I said, nothing to do with solvency, everything to do with panic and liquidity. And therefore, the only way you can solve this is by the European Central Bank to step in and say, we are going to buy all these bonds because it's a liquidity problem. It took the ECB two years to understand this, but then did it in 2012 and as a result, just the announcement in 2012 that the ECB was willing to buy unlimited amount of bonds of all these countries, and the crisis disappeared. Right? 
So we had been fixed by the idea of efficient markets, and the markets are always right, and if the markets say that a particular government risk of being insolvent, we should impose austerity. This was the wrong approach. Yeah. And, and it, yeah. we did a lot of harm by imposing austerity on these countries. Um, but in the end, we learned yeah, yeah, that exactly. it's a different yeah. the diagnosis. But we had to step outside of our paradigm, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think outside the box. And on the topic of thinking outside the box, we have technologies nowadays like quantum computing and, of course, generative AI. So do you see it becoming easier with these technologies to apply the theory of behavioral macro to the real world, like for policymakers as well? You mean AI? AI, yeah, AI. I yeah. Never, never thought about this. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's maybe it is, but don't forget that AI is just is a stat statistical exactly. program, right? That uses a massive amount of data, which is based on current knowledge, right? And if you now look at current knowledge and the mainstream knowledge about macro, it's, it's just mainstream. And chances are that AI will just repeat this. Yeah. So I'm not sure AI is a good mechanism to think out of the box, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, it's a huge black box that it uses, and it uses all the, the elements in that black box. And it, I don't think it really the kind of instrument that will do the... Um, out of the box thinking. Yeah. But I'm not sufficiently <laughs> expert on AI to, to be 100% sure about this. Okay. And uh, to kind of round up this section on behavioral macro, a notable behavioral economist uh, and Nobel Prize winner, Richard Thaler, once said that macroeconomics is just microeconomics with a summation sign. Yeah, Do you think that, yeah. say, that quote applies to beha the behavioral world as well? No, not at all. I mean, <laughs> of course, I know this. That, that was macroeconomics has become. You just yeah. have individual behavior, you describe individual behavior, and then you add up. Yeah. But these are all individuals on their own, right? Yeah. And you do not take into account that they interact with each other yeah. and that this interaction can lead to amplification effects, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, no, that's the wrong view. That, it's like thinking that uh, you look at, at the forest, you can look at the forest in, in the forest and then you, you see lots of interesting things. But sometimes you have to look at the forest bird's eye and then you see other things, right? It's not the same thing, just not adding up what you saw there uh, at the bottom of the forest, right? So you, the, the, the macroeconomic dynamics is, is, has different dimensions because of interactions yeah. between these individuals, which you don't get... Um, if you just add it up. Exactly. So throughout this hour, we looked in, past, in the past, exploring both your career, your views, your positions. And I think it is fair to wrap up this interview for some look in the future. Um, to quote you from the book that we discussed today, I believe I am now less ideologically driven and tend to think more pragmatically about the role which market and government should fulfill. And as university students, we are more likely to be ideologically driven in our thinking. What would be your advice for our young and impressionable minds? Well, just look at the facts, right? We, um, the facts should dictate what you think, not the other way around. Um, and therefore, you should be open to um, discard yeah. your thinking if it's not... Um, according to the facts. But of course, it's difficult because that's, our brain works differently, right? We have this um, confirmation bias, for example. We, we have a particular way of thinking and then we are selective in the way we look at the facts. We say, oh, this fact does not, is not consistent with my frame of thinking. I will just set it aside. So we have to, it's difficult, we have to try to set that aside. But it, yeah. That's what you have to do. That's my advice. So look at the facts. Try to eliminate the confirmation bias. Right? And be open to new things and change. Be open to change your views all the time. Yeah. I hope that everyone in the audience heard that. So uh -huh. with this note, Professor De Graaf, thank you so much for this hour, uh, for those intriguing insights, and we hope to see more of you in the future. Okay. And a big thank you, of course, to the audience as well. For those of you who haven't gotten enough of room for discussion, I have a few announcements. 
Tomorrow, we will be hosting the Minister of Education, Robert Dijkgraaf, uh, between 4 and 5 o'clock. The interview will be in Dutch. And if you'd like to get tickets, you can get them on our website. And one more. On Monday, next week, we will be having the immigration sociologist, Professor Hein de Haas. So if that's something that you might be interested in, please come right by our stage between 1 and 2 as well. And finally, I just want to have a big round of applause for both you and for Professor de Haas. Thank you very much.